Well, good morning, Fire Hall Worship Community and everybody joining us online. What a thrill it is that we get to come together to study the Word of God together. So I want to tell you about Renee Leinick. Renee Leinick had a problem. And as we discovered a few weeks ago, a problem is the perfect breeding ground for a startup. As a young French doctor back in 1816, he had just stepped into the examination room and was instantly confronted with a rather merry, robust, and ample woman complaining of chest pains. Before he could even get the word bonjour out, his mind had fast forwarded to what was about to happen. He would indicate to the woman that he needed to listen to her heart. Then he would approach her, put his right hand on her back and press his ear to her heart, moving his head around her bounteous chest to find the best place to hear the heart. He managed to get a sheepish bonjour out, but knew he needed to think fast if he was going to avoid this very awkward moment. So Lina grabbed a piece of paper as he went by the desk, rolled it into a trumpet-shaped funnel, put the large end to the woman's chest and a small end to his ear, and was genuinely shocked. He could hear her heart more clearly and louder than if he had put his ear directly to her chest. Well, three years later, Lynek, also a musician who was skilled at carving his own flutes, presented a contraption he called a stethoscope to the French Academy of Science and published his findings in 1819. It was a wooden tube with a bit of a trumpet end that rested on the chest of the patient. Stethos is chest in Greek, and scopus is to see or examine. However, Linux's invention was just the beginning of a long journey to what we have today. In 1851, 25 years after René Linux's death, an Irish doctor named Arthur Leard modified the stethoscope, employing a bell-shaped end to rest on the patient's chest, leading to two ends, one for each ear. It would take another 90 years before the next innovation would be added to the stethoscope. A two-sided steel disc, one side to examine the respiratory system and the other to examine the cardiovascular system. And this brings us to observations number seven and eight. Let's review our observations on startups really quickly. Number one, the best startups are birthed out of a problem. Number two, startups are highly organic and driven by passion. Number three, many startups are infected with naive optimism. Number four, the best startups aren't afraid to disrupt. Number five, startups require a tremendous amount of collective energy. Number six, sometimes a startup takes years to launch. They require patience and resilience. And number seven, often the startup is just the beginning, breaking new ground with the potential of many improvements and advancements. And number eight, those who dare a startup should expect opposition. In 1885, a professor of medicine stated, he that hath ears to hear let him use his ear and not a stethoscope. And even the founder of the American Heart Association, L.A. Connor, who lived from 1866 to 1950, carried a silk handkerchief with him to place on the patient's chest, preferring to listen to the heart the old-fashioned way. So in honor of Renee Leinach and a stethoscope, I want to give you a little test. I'm going to play four heartbeat sounds for you, and I want you to tell me which one of them is unhealthy or abnormal. We'll simply identify them as number one, number two, number three, and number four. Ready? Here we go. Here's the first one. Okay, here's number two. Okay, two down, two to go. Here's heartbeat number three, and we're looking for the unhealthy or abnormal one. Number three. All right, our last one before it's pencils down and you need to hand in your test. Number four, here we go. All right, we have some doctors who are part of Riverwood, so I'm not sure that it's entirely fair that you're playing the game, but for everyone else, which one was the unhealthy or abnormal heartbeat? Would you say number one? Hands up. Number two? Was it number three? Hands up or number four? Well, let me give you the answer visually. Here's the first one. If your heart sounds like number one, you'd be diagnosed with a S3 and S4 gallop, not the healthiest heart rhythm to have. Here's the second one. If your heart sounds like number two, you'd be diagnosed with an atrial septal defect. Okay, this is tricky. That's two unhealthy and abnormal rhythms already. We're gonna to listen to number four next.
If your heart sounds like number four, you'd be diagnosed with a split S1. Yikes, three of these are unhealthy and abnormal rhythms. In fact, the only normal and healthy heartbeat in our little test was number three. Here's number three. Now I'm guessing that you're gonna have a lot more appreciation for the next doctor who listens to your heart with a stethoscope, cause it can be tricky stuff. But I wonder if you know the sound and the rhythm of the heart in a healthy church. What do you think that sounds like? If the sound of a healthy heart is lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, what would be the sound of a healthy church and a healthy rhythm for those in that church? Well, that's what we're gonna to try to answer today. But first, a quick recap for those of you who are just joining us. This is week four in a five-week study we're calling Startup Forever. We've been studying startups, whether they be business, organization, relationships, marriages, or churches, and what it takes to bring back vibrancy and energy and dynamic impact and excitement in that business, organization, relationship, marriage, or church that are long past their startup phase. And we've been studying the world's greatest startup, the church, that we read about in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, that has now expanded to 20 million outlets worldwide. Now, I'm not gonna reteach everything that we've learned over the last three weeks, but I'm gonna give you two bullet points. We discovered that the people in the first church ever, number one, they had popped. Like a kernel of popcorn, the heat of their faith had been turned up, the internal pressure had increased, and when the hard outer shell couldn't take it anymore, they exploded, they turned inside out, and their faith actions had expanded 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 times what they had previously been. They were praying together, they were worshiping together, they were serving together. Everyone was an entrepreneur and an owner in the first church. And they'd been so transformed, they were giving and even selling their stuff to care for one another. In fact, not only had they popped, but number two, they were set free to give. You get the sense that it was Thanksgiving every day in the early church. Last weekend, we said that they had kicked Gollum out of their heart and had become hilarious givers instead of holding onto that piece of gold and saying, my precious, my precious. And today we observe what made them healthy was the rhythm of their heart. Number three, they were determined to have a healthy rhythm. See if you can detect this church's heartbeat and their rhythm as I read the story of the world's greatest startup for us again. That day, about 3,000 took him at his word, were baptized and were signed up. They joined with the other believers in regular attendance at the apostles' teaching sessions and at the communion meals and prayer meetings. Everyone around was in awe all those wonders and signs done through the apostles. And all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding super everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's needs was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal, a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw, Every day, their number grew as God added those who were being saved. Over the last few weeks, we've been studying this idea that we find in the Bible that God's church is the body of Christ. Now that doesn't mean that we're just an assembly, like a school body or a legislative body. It means that we are the physical presence of Jesus on earth. It means that we collectively are his hands and feet. It means if someone is going to encounter Jesus, there's a very good chance that they will do so because the body, his being, his body. But this whole idea of the body of Christ got me thinking this past week. If we're his body, and Christ is the head of the church, as it says in Ephesians and Colossians, then what is the heart of the church? What is the heartbeat of the church? What, what is it that pumps the lifeblood of Christ around the body? What is the circulatory system of the body of Christ? Well, it's simple, our relationships. You can't read the story of the world's greatest startup without hearing the pounding of the heart of this first church, which was the Holy Spirit pumping through the veins and networks of their relationships. You know, when you boil the entire Bible down, the whole thing, all 783,137 words, it all distills down to these 13 words. Be intimate with God, be in deep community with others, make a difference. That is all the Bible talks about, page after page, the same three messages, how to be intimate and tight in a relationship with God, how to be in deep and meaningful relationships with others, 
and how to be a difference maker and impact the world around you. And this second one, our relationship with each other, is so important because it is the very heartbeat of the body of Christ. And you can tell if a church is healthy and has a healthy heart by listening to the relationships and the rhythm of those relationships. So, what is the rhythm of the heart of the first church? It's not lub-dub, 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 but it's nearly as simple. The rhythm of the first church was gather, go, gather, go, gather, go. Let me show you. They joined with the other believers in regular attendance at the apostles' teaching sessions and at the communion meals and prayer meetings. They didn't miss fire or skip beats. They consistently and regularly with rhythm gathered and you get the sense that these are large gatherings. Then we read this in verse 43. Everyone around was in awe, all those wonders and signs done through the apostles, and all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding super everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. The filling of the heart with the gathering was followed with the emptying of the heart as they went to live out what they had learned. The apostles are going out and using God's power to perform miracles, engaging the people around the church and healing them. The believers are living throughout the week in wonderful harmony, and as they are going back to their homes and their places of work, they're finding ways to support their church and God's work. But that going is followed by gathering again. Verse 46, they followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home, every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praise God. For the early church, their large group gathering wasn't enough. So they broke it down and made the gathering point smaller, meeting in one another's homes. But they knew that they weren't meant just to take in and fill up in these small group gatherings and homes. So, so they followed this rhythm, following the taking in gathering and the going out and impacting the world. People in general liked what they saw. Every day their number grew as God added those who were saved. And throughout the New Testament, we see this rhythm of gathering, going, gathering, going, gathering, going, gathering, going. However, a little later on, by the time the New Testament book of Hebrews was written, Christ followers were already struggling to keep the rhythm. In Hebrews 10, 24, we read, let us consider how to inspire each other to greater love and to righteous living, not forgetting to gather as a community as some have forgotten, but encouraging each other, especially as the day of his return approaches. The church in Hebrews had developed a bit of a murmur or a skipping or a galloping heart. For them, it was more like gather, go, 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 gather, go, 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 gather, go, 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 which isn't healthy. But keeping a consistent gather, go, gather, go, gather, go rhythm to our relationships and faith is challenging. You know, a couple of months ago, we were talking about world population, and I have not been able to shake the graph that we looked at it's believed at the time of Christ that the world's total population was 190 million people. That's about 25 million people less than currently live in the country of Brazil alone, which is currently about 2.5% of the world's population. However, by 1928, the population had grown 1,000% to 2 billion people worldwide. 50 years after that, by 1975, that number had again doubled to 4 billion people on the planet. And by November 15th of this year, 2022, it's believed that that number will have doubled again to 8 billion people on the planet. To me, that's mind blowing. The world has 4,200% more people than it did when the first church was birthed. And when I see that chart, I see 8 billion people trying to make a living. 8 billion people creating and inventing products and services that have never existed before. I see more people on the planet than ever before wanting to be fed, employed, entertained, amused, distracted, and served. During our lifetime, our world has exploded with people, technology, knowledge, opportunity, choices, options, and possibilities like no other time in human history. In 1971, when the world's population was half the size it is today, Alvin Toffler wrote a book called Future Shock. In it, he coined a phrase, overchoice. He said, in the future, people will be paralyzed in life with too many choices. So for many, the healthy faith and healthy church rhythm of gather, go, gather, go, gather, go, has become go, 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 gather, go, 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 gather. 
And the go in this case isn't go minister to others and selflessly serve one another, but simply try to keep up with all the options our world offers us. But Acts 2 and the story of the first church calls us back to a healthier rhythm. Gather, go. Gather, go. Gather, go. And notice that this church had two types of gatherings. One was the large group gathering. This was for teaching and worship and the prayer gathering. And the other was small groups in homes, more personal gatherings. So 2,000 years later, with 4,200% more people and opportunities and distractions on the planet, that's the kind of church we're trying to be. On the weekends, large group teaching, worship, and prayer gatherings. And, and during the week, we have small groups in home, more personal gatherings. In fact, a number of years ago, we decided that all we want to do as a church is to be intimate with God, be in deep community with others, and make a difference. So we've attempted to restructure our church to align with these three. We worship, learn, grow, inspire, and mobilize in our large group gatherings on the weekend, and then everything else we do is in the context of small groups. In fact, let me show you what this actually looks like. We've divided our small groups into two different kinds, network groups and home-based groups. Now, network groups meet in one of our church buildings. And if the group is larger than six to 10, they will break into smaller groups. So for instance, our uprising students have 14 different small groups within their middle school and high school gatherings, each with a dedicated small group leader and the same students every week. We have nine different network groups, like grief share, divorce care, a photography group, a finance budgeting group, a 20s and 30s and 30s and 40s single group, even a snowbirds group, and a bunch of others. All said, we have 60 different around a table with a leader groups that meet in our church buildings because everything we do, we want to do in the context of smaller life-on-life -life relationship groups. Then we have the home-based groups, and we currently have 23 of these running. Now, they're spread all throughout the city, and because of the pandemic, we are very much in a rebuilding mode. But these are 23 homes that have been opened up where Jesus followers are gathering for an hour or two to share their stories, support one another, dig into the Bible, pray and eat together, and then be filled up to go. We're in a rebuilding mode, but we currently have 83 small around a table or around a living room groups of people saying, I have a billion options of how I can live my life and as many distractions teasing my time and choices, but I'm gonna make sure that I have God's rhythm of gathering and going, gathering and going, gathering and going, setting the pace for my life. And from what I can see, that rhythm is gather large, go, gather small, go, gather large, go, gather small, go. Now I can tell, for some of you, I'm preaching to the choir. You love your small group. For some of you, you've been with the same small group for four, seven, 10 years, and you can't imagine doing life without your small group. For you, small groups isn't a program or an initiative, it's a way of life. You know that every one of us is going to experience difficult times or full-on disasters, and you've stood with each other through each of those. You were there for the heart attack, kicking in and helping out. You were there for that season of parenting that, that someone in your group was kind of going a bit crazy. You were there for the loss of more than a couple of aging parents. And you were there when the pandemic claimed someone's job. And you watched as your group rallied and prayed, brought meals and supported one another. It was nothing but the lifeblood of Christ pumping from person to person in the context of meaningful relationships. But you've also experienced the good times together. The big football game, when your entire small group came out, drove halfway across the city to cheer on your kid even though he only played for three minutes, but you could see him beaming at having so many fans. You were there for the birthdays, and you've lost count of how many barbecues you've done together. You've disagreed on theology and argued about what the Bible passage actually means, but with as much energy and passion, you come around one another and pray for each other. So you don't need me to sell you on the value and benefits of having a small group or, or journeying with a small group. However, some of you do need some reasons. So let me give you five. Number one, it will strengthen your internal commitments. Imagine a football player who is totally dedicated to the game. He practices every day. He works out, he eats right, he throws the ball, but has no team to catch and throw the ball back. Imagine that this football player is trying to play football and become a better player by himself. How far do you think he's gonna make it in the world of football? Probably not very far. 
with no one to tackle and no one to run drills with, with no coach to challenge him and call a bit more out of him, eventually he's going to get discouraged or at best remain a mediocre, inexperienced, and underdeveloped player. But what happens when the same player joins a team? Everything changes. He's being stretched, celebrated, and cheered on. He doesn't have to carry the ball down the field by himself. He has a whole team to help him get there. His internal commitment was strong when he started, but alone it became weak. However, now with the team, it becomes stoked again. He's learning new skills, thinking new thoughts, aware of new strategies, and doing it all in the context of a team. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1.12. When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. The original Greek word interpreted encourage is sympericaleo. It's another one of those compound words made up of two other words. The sim part is a relationship word, meaning with or to accompany. Parakaleo is to call loudly and invite to be at one side. I love this because the word parakaleo is one of the Holy Spirit's formal names interpreted the helper. What Paul is saying is that we need to be that to one another, a parakaleo, in relationship where we call loudly and invite others to come help. But you can't do that if you don't have a team and are playing alone. Number two, it will focus you on the important stuff. Let me ask you a question. How many meaningful conversations that go deeper than just your job, the news, the weather, the kids, your hobby, or the price of gas do you have in a week? How about in a month? For most of us, it's anywhere from zero to maybe a half. We just don't naturally allow ourselves to talk about the important stuff. We stay hidden behind our superficiality because it's far safer. Author Mike Iaconelli said, pretending is the grease of non-relationships. Pretending is how you and I get through the day without ever having to know each other. When I walk into a room, you say to me, how are you? Well, you don't want to know. And frankly, I don't want to tell you. So I just say, fine. And you go, fine. And off we go. But a small group of your own helps you fight the urge to pretend and be superficial and allows you to focus on the stuff of life that's important. Number three, it will power up your faith and increase your impact. There's this principle that Jesus spoke that says this, whenever two or three of you come together in my name, I will be there with you. Matthew 18, 20. Jesus spoke this in the context of mending a relationship, but it certainly applies to other experiences in life as well. When two or three or five or six or seven or ten get together, Jesus is right there, ready to do what he does best. Inspire, empower, and increase. When you have a committed group of people to journey with, it will power up your faith and increase your impact. Number four, it will build protection around your life. Ecclesiastes 4 and 9 says this, It's better to have a partner than go it alone. Share the work, share the wealth. And if one falls down, the other helps. But if there's no one to help, tough. Two in a bed, keep warm. Alone, you shiver all night. By yourself, you're unprotected. With a friend, you can face the worst. Can you round up a third? A three-stranded rope isn't easily snapped. Spiritually, trying to journey this life alone, you're gonna be unprotected. But with a friend or a small group of friends, you can battle the temptations of life, wade through the inevitable sadness, Endure the unavoidable pains and overcome embarrassing failures. Okay, let's move on to the fifth reason that you will benefit from being part of a small group. Number one was it will strengthen your internal commitments. Number two, it will focus you on the important stuff. Number three, it will power up your faith and increase your impact. Number four, it will build protection around your life. And number five, it will make you a little more like Jesus. Now, I don't mean that you're going to be more holy or more righteous and more Jesus-like, although we certainly hope that that will happen. But what I'm talking about is on a more practical level, because Jesus was in a small group. And if you're in one, you're going to be a little more like him. As soon as Jesus went public with his ministry, he began to gather his small group. In fact, I've been saying that Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47 is the birth of the first church, but technically, the first church started in a small group that Jesus gathered. And it was out of that small group that the first church was born. Jesus had a very clear spiritual rhythm of gather, go, gather, go, gather, 
go. He set the pattern for us and he showed us that the heartbeat of the church is relationships. It's through our interconnectedness and relationships that the Holy Spirit travels and moves, grows, connects, instructs, challenges, protects, and encourages. In fact, we're so taken with this idea of our, our relationships being the heartbeat of the church that starting today, we're rebranding small groups and we're gonna start referring to them as life groups. After all, what is life if it isn't sharing together, growing together, and serving together? So I'd like to challenge every Riverwooder to test drive the life group experience. And here's how it's gonna work. Normally we run three 10 week sessions of life groups in a year. Thanksgiving to Christmas is session one, and then we take a break and, and some groups reorganize. Mid January through to Easter is session two, and then we take a break and reorganize a bit. And then Easter until the end of May is session three, and then we break for summer. Now some life groups meet all year and we leave that up to them. This fall though, we're gonna do something a little bit different. We're wanting every Riverwooder to have a five week taste and see life group experience. So new home-based groups are gonna be running for just five weeks, November 1st to November 30th. Now, it would be impossible for a few hundred people to go to Pastor Dunstan and say, match me up with my life group, or I'll host a life group, but you have to find me the people. His job isn't a matchmaker, so that's not gonna work for this five week experience. Instead, we wanna challenge you to be entrepreneurs and owners and go on your own startup adventure. So here's what we'll do. If you'll open up your home and offer to host a group, we'll provide you with a life group coach to be a support and check in with you every once in a while and the life group teaching. So then all you need to do is put on the coffee, invite the people and guide your life group gathering. You might say, well, that sounds scary. <laughs> yep, startups often are. You might be thinking, well, that sounds a bit risky and chaotic. You bet, startups often are. But this could also be a game changer. So on your seat in our live services and on our life group page on our website is a, a card that says, I'll host one of those life groups for five weeks. Once you've gathered your people, register your life group so that we can assign you a coach and, and get you the material you need to get ready for our November 1st launch. You know, we've talked enough about being a startup forever kind of church. Now is the time for action. Now is the time for us to put feet to all of this teaching and go do something. Church, it's time to turn up the heat and pop, to break through the hard shell and turn inside out. It's time to kick Gollum out and, and be set free to give hilariously. And it's time to practice the biblical rhythm of gather, go, gather, go, gather, go with a new season of small group gatherings called Life Groups. It's time for the heartbeat of the church to beat boldly.